us the spirit of understanding, to help us be open to all that she teaches us about the moral life, so that we too may truly have a good life. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Adeline Murray. She is a <coughs> professor at Lord's University, an ethics professor, and then she also hosts a radio show on Annunciation Radio called The Virtuous Life. Thank you Matt, for being with us and presenting to us. Thank you, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Usually I have my teacher voice here is pretty well. Um, it's great to be here tonight. Um, I, um, I will always do my best. I move around, but I promise the social distance, so I'll do my best to do that. Um, but but uh, Tom asked me uh, to present. I, I love this, uh, this area of study, obviously. I teach ethics, so morality has always been an area that I love um, and have grown kind of deeper and deeper into, but understanding how much it has to come kind of before it, and hopefully I can make all of those connections for you tonight. The first thing we have to ask ourselves, and notice the, the, top, the name of the topic, Christian morality is the good life, okay, is the good life. This is, um, a lot of people might say that's up for debate, <laughs> but as Christians, um, it's not. <laughs> it really is the good life. But we really have to come to own that, I think. And, uh, and that's one of the things when I teach, you know, I always tell my kids, I, I can teach you things and you can take it into your head and you can repeat it back to me. I can never make you believe things, right? Um, you, you, you just have to open your heart um, and, and allow uh, the grace of God to come in and to be open to that. Um, so I can teach you um, and teach my students what the good life really is. But at some point, um, you, you really have to buy into it, right? You have to really say, yes, it is. And so we're going to talk tonight about what is morality, what is the good life, and then we can kind of put it all together and uh, talk about it from the stance of it really is the good life. So what is morality? Um, at the heart, it's really just rules we live by. That's it. If somebody says, do you have any morality? Of course you do. <laughs> okay? Because all of us have rules we live by. Um, I always tell my students, even the person who says, I don't live by any rules, just made a rule they live by. Okay? <laughs> Not living by any rules. So everybody lives by rules. And I think that's one of the things that so often in our society, um, people really think there is kind of a, a, a place where there is no moral thought. You know, it's kind of like um, a, a land where no one has any kind of belief whatsoever. I tell my students it doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. Everybody has beliefs. So when somebody says to you, um, and as I get a lot in my ministry over these 45 years, um, you know, well, quit cramming your beliefs down my throat, <laughs> right? And I would say, well, first of all, I can't cram beliefs <laughs> down your throat. Um, I can share ideas with you, but you have beliefs. It's not like you don't have any beliefs that I'm telling you must this, you have beliefs too. And so I think when we talk about morality, we have to understand that everybody has it. So the question is not, um, do people have morality? Because that's what um, William Madison, who's a, a moral theologian, calls descriptive morality. It just describes the rules you live by. Um, the discussion we have and should have in our society is what are the rules we should live by? And that's normative morality. Um, and so that's the discussion because when we talk about how to live, we're really asking ourselves, is there, is one way of living better than another? Right? Is it better to live in a van down by the river? <laughs> or is it better to have at least a roof over your head where you can go to bed at night and some food to eat? Right? Um, is it so when we talk about, I remember years ago when I was teaching uh, morality, I had a question from one of C.S. Lewis's book <clears throat> about, is Christian morality any better than Nazi morality? And I actually had students say, well, really no, there's really not much difference in the sense that this morality is morality, and who are we to say Nazi morality isn't good? <laughs> Me? I don't know if I can say that. I will say that. Nazi morality is not better. Okay? Um, so, and this is, I think, one of the things 
need to live, we're not being tolerant, or we're not being generous, or we're not, and I always say, you know, Christ tells us to do the truth in love, but you can be the most loving person in the world and you're still going to offend people, because that's what sin is. We don't want to hear the truth. Um, and so this idea of understanding a better way of living, is there a better way of living, we have to have that discussion because if the answer is no, then one way of living is no better than any other, then we moved into what we call moral relativism. Everybody can choose for themselves what they want to do. There's no objective right or wrong. You might think it's right, I think it's wrong, let's all go on the line. Okay? The problem is we can't live that way. Even my students can figure that out. <laughs> they always say, once they start really understanding relativism, they realize you can't live that way. It, it just perpetuates a life of chaos. You can't have everybody having their own truth, um, their own understanding of their own ideas of right and wrong. In fact, my honors class just finished a major paper a couple of weeks ago on moral relativism. And I usually don't let them give their opinions very much because I'm kind of grounded in something. Um, <laughs> but um, and, but they, they could do their whole paper and then the last page and they want it to share a reflection or give me some insight, uh, personal insight, they could do that. Uh, and I had one student um, write, you know, I never really thought much about this until I took this class. Um, and uh, I never really thought much about moral relativism, relativism. But the other day I was talking with a friend of mine and he said, it's okay to lie sometimes, <laughs> you know. Um, because if you're trying to do something good, lying would be okay. And he says, and then all of a sudden I understood, he's a moral relativist. <laughs> 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 yes, okay, I'm on the right track. But, but that's the thing, right? If, if, if we're a moral relativist, then there is no objective truth. Right? Everybody gets to decide for themselves. But truth is essential to living the moral life. Because we can't do good without truth. And even just in a very reasoned fashion, right, you cannot make good decisions if you're not giving the truth about something. I'm not even talking about God right now. I'm just talking about life, right? If you go to buy a car at the used car lot and they don't tell you anything about it or they didn't tell you it was in a hurricane down south and was covered by water, right, you're not going to be able to make a good decision as to whether this is a good car to buy. Because right, it's not based on truth. That's the way everything is in life. That's why I tell my students the truth is so important. And so when we talk about the idea of being able to discern the good, if I don't have truth, I'm going to have a hard time being able to accomplish the good because I'm going to be acting on things that are not true. So <clears throat> obviously, Christ tells us so much about truth, right? Uh, we sh you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I think it's very interesting that that's the question that Pilate asks of Christ, right? What is truth? I always, I, every time I hear that when we read the Passion, I think of that. You know, now I'm not real sure he really wanted to know what truth was, but maybe he did. Um, but there it was, right? The truth was standing right in front of him, and he didn't recognize it. Uh, what is truth? And truth, again, if you're going to see, is just so important when we talk about this moral life. So, when we talk about morality, rules we live by, and the, the, the truth helps us do the good, well then, what is the good life? Everybody wants the good life, right? I mean, that's Think about how we talk about the good life in our world today. Like when you get, when my, when my students are graduating from college, you know, if you say, well, what's the good life? They can tell you all kinds of stuff, right? Well, I want a new, you know, I want to be able to have a big house, um, you know, I want to have a good 401k, I want to be able to retire, you know, when I'm 60 and do what I want to do. That's the concept of the good life, right? That's, and that's a very worldly concept of the good life. Now, um, if you're a person, you know, you can make all those plans and never get there. Uh, and I think that's um, one of the things I always say, you know, I understand why 
why St. Benedict said we should reflect on our death daily. Because it keeps you focused, right? <laughs> and it doesn't let you get caught up in things that take you away from the eternal. And so when we talk about this good life, we start to ask ourselves, what is this? What does this look like, right? And what is it we all desire? If you say, what do you desire? Happiness is what we desire. Why do people want a big house? Because they think it'll make them happy. Why do they want a new car? They think it'll make them happy. Why do they want, right, college education? In the end, it'll make them happy. Why do they want a certain job? It's gonna make them happy. We can, we can kind of take anything that we want to do and trace and keep tracing it back. I do this with my students sometimes. Um, you know, well, why? I just keep asking why, and I keep asking why until I get to the end and keep writing that down at the end of the board. They're, they finally get like, oh, just because I'm going to be happy. Okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Because that is the last kind of thing that you want in and of itself, not for another reason. Happiness is something we all want. But the question, and certainly in our Christian lives, the question becomes, well, what, what is happiness, right? We think we know what it is, but if you really kind of back up, you realize you really don't a lot of times. Because, and Augustine even talked about that. He talked about being restless. And if you're familiar with Augustine, right, he talks about this restlessness that he had in his, in his life, that he thought he could fill with things that would finally fulfill him. Right? I mean, he, you know, that whole thing, the Lord made me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was, I just want to have a little fun, right? Because I think that might, you know, that might make me happy. Um, but the idea here is, is that happiness is not just a if we think it's a feeling, we miss our whole understanding of what it really means to be happy. Because it's not a feeling, it's a state of being. Okay? It's really a state of being. Peter Craig, one of my favorite guys, says that when you talk about happiness, you understand that it's only really happiness when you can be happy in the midst of suffering. Then you know it's no longer a feeling. Some people might say, well, isn't that Christian joy? Sure. Okay. But, but great philosophers talked about it in the sense of, of as happiness, Aristotle. So the idea that happiness is really human flourishing, human fulfillment, right? That doesn't mean I'm going to feel good all the time. It just means, you know, and, and you, you probably already know this, is some of the toughest things that you've gotten through in life have been sometimes the most fulfilling. You know, you, you've gotten through them and you've looked back and you realize, I'm a better person because of that. Or I've been able to um, maybe to reach out to other people and to empathize more because of what I've just gone through. There is a sense of human flourishing in the midst of that, human fulfillment. And it is not just an emotion. It's just not, oh, this is fun, okay? It's something much deeper than that, much more centered than that. And that is really what we want. <clears throat> All human beings <clears throat> desire that. They want this. And I think when we understand the gospel message, isn't that really what we talk about is eternal life, right? Eternal life is never-ending happiness, never-ending joy, never-ending kind of being in the presence of God. There is nothing that can surpass that in fulfillment. So when we talk about this desire, it is implanted in each of us. But our question is always going to be, how do we do that, right? How do I understand happiness and how, how do I kind of go about that in my life? So, so when we talk about happiness as being what we desire, we have to look at the whole concept of good. How do I know it's good? And we are in a topsy-turvy world right now. Um, good is evil, evil is good many times. Um, and so we have to be clear, and I think that's a, a wonderful thing about our world life. Obviously, obviously we know God is good. God is all good, and everything is good.
good, all things are good in and through God. Now, and we also know, obviously, when there is evil, God can bring good out of it. Because God is always good. He's all good. And so when I talk to my students about being um, made in the image of God, I always talk to them about that idea of, um, some of you may remember, I was kind of on the cusp of the Baltimore Catechism, like I started in the Baltimore Catechism, but I didn't finish it. <laughs> um, but I remember we learned, like, uh, you know, the four characteristics of God. You know, he's, he's uh, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, and all-loving. Uh, and so I would say to my students, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? There it is. He shares that with us. The only difference is we're not all, because we're not God. <laughs> but he gave us the ability to know, to reason. He gave us the ability of power, free will, to choose. He gave us um, the ability to love. And he gave us the ability to know and be good, to choose good. So the understanding here is when we understand goodness, we know that this is all about God. So when we talk about Christian morality then, so we've talked about, okay, we know what morality is, um, we know what we desire. Um, so when we look at Christian morality, what is it? Well, we talk about the moral law. Now, <clears throat> law always makes us nervous, right? Um, because we think, oh, it's just about, we think of law as the minimum, right? Kind of the minimum I got to do. Um, and so, well, if I do that, then that's enough and I'm done. All right? <clears throat> now, I want you to kind of think of it this way. Think of, if you're a parent and you raise kids, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not a parent, but um, I've certainly seen a lot of people raise their children and had a lot of children in school. And I've told some of my students, you know, if you have kids and you let them do whatever they want, please don't send them to this school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, help me out here. Um, but you know what it means to form a child, right? The idea of forming a little one, their understanding. And I always, I always tell my students when I talk about our relationship with God, there is a kind of the the, the way um, humankind progressed in relationship with God is the way we individually um, progress in our relationship with God, if you think about it, right? Um, <clears throat> think about Abraham. What did he have to do? Only believe in one God. All he had to do, okay? His father was an idol maker. All he had to do was believe in one. That's all you got to do. That was hard enough. <laughs> okay, and Abraham struggled with that. Um, then we get to Moses uh, and the... Um, the, the, the Mosaic Covenant, okay. Okay, you kind of got this one God thing down. Um, so let's go with Ten Commandments because now we're trying to help you figure out how to treat one another. Right? And that's that list of, you know, don't kill, don't do this, don't do that, right? So if you think about it, that's kind of how we form children. Very simple things first, right? If, if you say um, to a three-year-old, um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I had... Um, had a friend once who's a three-year-old um, was taking my husband's golf club and banging it on the concrete. And I was trying to get him to stop. And I kept saying, Paul, stop. Paul, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and um, his mother started kind of talking to them, her and in this really kind of, now, Paul, this doesn't belong to you. It belongs to that nice man in the house. And I mean, she's going into this long kind of dissertation. I'm thinking, he's three. <laughs> you know? um, and he's still banging it on the ground. So I just leaned over and grabbed it from him, right? Then he bites me. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, in my head I'm thinking, okay, you, you got to form them at, at the appropriate, what they can get at that time before they move on, right? So the understanding is, you know, at the beginning, when we can't rationally think you know, things our parents just shout orders at us, right? Don't put your hand on the stove. Don't run out the traffic. Don't, you know. And we don't, you know, we're not smart enough. We don't have, I shouldn't say smart enough, but we don't have the brain capability yet of saying, well, excuse me, dear mother, why am I not allowed to put my hand on the stove? What will happen? Okay? We, we can't think that way now. We're not there. And so we, we continue to grow, and we get into our teenage years, and then we're, then we're Constantly asking why, right? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? This is when parents need the patience 
of Job. And, and they, they need to be able to explain things. Because a lot of times, because I said so, it doesn't work real good at that age anymore. All right? They may not want to hear it. Um, you can give them the most wonderful explanations in the world, but they may not just want to hear it and do what they want to do anyway. It's part of that stage. But at least, hopefully, you can start to engage them into some kind of conversation, right? And start to get them to look outside themselves. And then as you progress, <clears throat> you start to understand you can't live your life for you anymore. Right? If you get married, fall in love, get married, you understand real love is self-sacrificing. You, you know, if you're getting married because of you <laughs> and what you want, you're going to have a struggle. Real love is self-sacrificing. And so when we look at this in the eyes of how we grow in life with Christ, it's the same thing. We get to that stage. Okay, kind of like the rich young man. Yeah, I follow all the commandments. What else do I have to do? Right? That's kind of the you know teenage years. Okay, I did all that. Okay. Well, as we continue to grow, well, oh, give up everything and come follow me. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a little too. But it is right. There is this this idea of this growth. So when we talk about the moral law. If we don't understand the moral law as good, we can understand it in a very limited way of an elementary kid or maybe even a high school kid. They're just rules. They're just rules. And that's a really sad way to look at the moral law. Okay? The moral law are our rules, but the thing is, we have to believe the moral law is a part of the good life. By living the moral law, we will have the good life. If we don't believe it, we won't do it. They'll just be rules. Mm, you know. But when we understand that the moral law isn't given out of trying to hold us under a thumb, but is given out of great love, one, as a parent, think about it. You see your teenagers doing stuff and you're just ready to pull your hair out. Because you, you can see almost what's coming down the road if they stay on that path. Right? You say, oh my gosh, this isn't going to be pretty. You know, and yet they won't, you know, they won't listen. And I, I mean, it's just teenagers. I've seen adults do that. You know, where you see them heading down the road and you're thinking, don't, please, no, don't. This is not going to be pretty. This isn't going to be good. And yet they don't believe the moral law is given out of love. They see it being restricted, right? Well, who is God to tell me what I should and should not be doing? Oh, as parents, you give your kids rules because you love them. Not because you're trying to make their lives miserable, even though they think that's what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs>
needs to do what is good in this particular situation. So I don't need to make the natural law. I know the natural law so I can apply it to this situation in my life. That's what conscience does. Conscience doesn't define good and evil. That's already been defined. It looks at what's going on in my life right now and saying, is this good or evil? Okay, there's a big difference in that. Because I think sometimes we always thought conscience is kind of whatever we feel like doing. I, and one of the things I, on my test with my students, I always tell them, conscience is not a feeling. <laughs> okay, it's not how you feel about something. Um, and I always say, that will be on your exam, and I will tell you this right now, it's true and false. And if you say true, I will come and hunt you down. <laughs> like I said, if you get nothing else, please never say conscience is the way I feel about something. Okay, an emotional response. So God creates them with order and design. And so our task is to examine the givens in nature and try to understand its purpose. That's, I think, the beauty of philosophy and theology. It does things that science can't do. Um, it can't tell you, science can't tell you why you're here, right? It can tell you how your organs work in your body, <laughs> those kinds of things, but it really can't tell you your purpose. So the idea when we talk about knowing God, what this does for us in our moral life, it is so important to understand, to know God means we have to understand what is around us, and then it becomes kind of our to fulfill what God has designed. Not to inhibit it, not to destroy it, but to help fulfill it. Um, and, and again, as cooperators in this, so we always look to scripture and natural law, a law, revelation and natural law are the ways that we come to know the moral law. And the moral law is the truth. Okay, the truth. And then, you know, one of the big things, um, that I always have to do with my bioethics classes is to get them to realize these do not contradict one another because they tend to want to interpret um, some of the principles of natural law the way they want to interpret them. Um, and I'm always like, no, they, no, that's antithetical to scripture, then your interpretation is not correct. They're, they don't oppose one another. So, we talk about these moral laws, these rules, the natural law, scripture, right? Um, the moral law that's revealed in Scripture. The question becomes then, will the rules we live by lead us to human flourishing? Do these rules, this natural law, this, uh, the revealed law in Scripture, does this really make us more who we're called to be as human beings? And Christ tells us very clearly in John, he has come so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. What else is abundant life than human flourishing? There's nothing greater than that. Human flourishing is the abundant life that Christ comes to give. So it is not just a part of this temporal order, but it's also part of the eternal relationship that we have with the Lord. Now, so often, when we look, especially the Ten Commandments, when we look at a lot of the, you know, um, commandments, people tend to think, and I've heard my students say this sometimes, all the church does is tell us, no, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do this. And I'm like, well, that's really kind of sad that you see it that way. That's an easy way to say it, right? But with every no, there is a yes. And that's, I think, what we have to understand. Every time we are saying no to something evil, we are saying yes to something wonderful. So when we talk about things like thou shalt not kill, right, very basic, what are, what are we saying yes to? We're saying yes to life, right? To the goodness of life. And not just this human life in this temporal world, but eternal life. Life that goes on forever, that is not limited by this temporal um, when we talk about um, not committing adultery, um, the, the idea of the joy of marriage, right? What that does to be able to give oneself totally to somebody else. Why do 
remember I teach a lot of teenagers. So, <clears throat> and, you know, they see anything about sex is no. No, no. <laughs> All the church says is no. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, we talk about, again, you know, to talk about the natural law. What is it created for? What does it mean? What does it mean to use it honestly? Right? Versus however I want. Or does it have a meaning? Or can I just give it the meaning I want to give it? Right? Those kinds of questions. So good discussions. Even if they don't like it, right? They still understand by saying no to premarital sex, I'm saying yes to something else. Right? I'm saying yes to something else. Um, and I always use this story that I heard years ago, which is a great example of, of getting these kids to understand the yes part. Um, uh, I was listening to a, a speaker on chastity a number of years ago, and she was talking about when her husband proposed to her. And she said, oh, I was so excited when he proposed to me, you know, I slipped the ring on my finger, you know. And she said, I looked at it and I said, oh, honey, that is just a beautiful ring. Of course I'll marry you. It's just a beautiful ring. She <laughs> said, think of what, how I would have felt if he had said, yeah, the five other girls I gave it to really liked it also. <laughs> that 
that you really don't believe the moral law brings about the good life. You only follow it to get something out of it. Okay? Where the morality of happiness believes that the moral life is the good life. It is the thing that makes us flourish. And probably um, one of the best, um, let me look back here, one of the best examples comes from the Republic, um, which I'm sure Father Tom is quite, quite more familiar with than I am. Um, but the, the Socrates is having a discussion with Glaucon. And Glaucon believes that people will only do good if they're going to get something out of it. That's the only reason you do good. If you're not going to get something out of it, you never do it. Socrates, on the other hand, doesn't believe that. He says, no, people do the, do the moral law, they follow the moral rules, because that is the good life. That is the thing that really makes them flourish. And so they have a, a debate about the Ring of Gyges, where it's a story of um, a, a shepherd, um, and I'm going to you know, probably just give you little bits and pieces of this, but, but the shepherd found a ring, and if he put the ring on and turned it a certain way, he disappeared. And he realized, aha, if I do that, I can do anything I want, and no one will know it's me. Okay? So he said, you know, so he did. Put the ring on, turned it, he disappeared. He killed the king so he could seduce the queen, so he could become the king and have all this land. And so he did it for wealth and power. <clears throat> and Glaucon said, yeah, <laughs> that's what people do. <laughs> that's what people do. Uh, you know, he, he's doing um, what he really wants to do because he doesn't believe in the moral law, that the moral law is good. He's going to be able to get something out of it. And so he'll only do something good if he can get something good in return. Where Socrates is like, no, that's not true. Morality and happiness means that I do the right thing because it is the right thing and it leads to human flourishing. And I don't get anything out of it. Now, William Madison, one of the authors that writes about this, says so often we tend to think, you know, there are times you feel obligated to do the right thing. <laughs> right? And you feel like you've got to do this. Um, but he says that can still be the morality of happiness. He said, you know, and I think about this, my dad ended up in a nursing home, right? Well, you know, it's not fun to go to nursing homes and visit your parents. And especially when they don't start to recognize you anymore, right? I mean, it's kind of like, you kind of, kind of, at least for me, I kind of said, okay. Shoo, okay, gotta go to that nursing home and see Dad, right? It wasn't something that I just wanted to run in there and do every day. Uh, okay, let's go do that. Um, I, and, and there was this sense of obligation. This was my dad. He did so much for me. I loved him. He was a wonderful man. Um, but I wasn't doing it to get something. See, that's the difference. There are times we feel like I'm going to do the right thing. Maybe our desire isn't where it should be. Right? But we're still able to do what we should do, knowing it is good and right. Um, and we're not doing it because it's going to get us something. And Madison says that is still morality of happiness. He said, because there's still something in us that knows that obligation is still the right and good thing to do. Even though we're not going to get something. Now, if you're only going to go visit your dad because you're hoping to inherit, Okay, that's a whole other story, right? Now you step into the morality of obligation. Because, okay, I'll go visit Dad because when, you know, when he shuffles off, I want to make sure he remembers me in the will. Okay? Um, now, that, now I've stepped into morality of obligation. Notice my action is still the same. I'm still going to see my dad. Um, but one, the intent is because it is good and right. Not because I'm going to get some out of it. And even better than that, if it's not out of love, which I'm sure most of us do that with our parents, right? So the idea is that when we talk about this, this moral code, this moral law, this good life, this morality, again, Christian morality tells us that this is the law that leads to human flourishing. That is how we know it is the good life. 
Christ says over and over and over, if you love me, you will keep my commands. I see so often we, we talk about does God really love us? And that is fundamental to the moral life, right? And it's relationship. Moral life isn't an isolated life. The moral life is living in relationship with one another. And first and foremost, it's our relationship with God. And so if we don't have a relationship with God, the moral life just becomes a set of rules we just kind of click off, you know, and have to do. And we're not even convinced maybe it makes our life all that much better because we don't know the Lord. And in order to do that, in order to, to know and to respond in love, we do have to know who we are. Who am I created to be, right? And we are made in the image of God, like I said, that that is who I am in the world today. And if I don't have a relationship with God, then I don't know who I am. <laughs> and if I don't know who I am, how do I know what's good? Except maybe what the world tells me is good. So my understanding has to go back to that I am made in God's image out of this great love that he has for us. And he exhibits we are made for this self-sacrificial love. This is the hardest thing any of us will ever get to, is to really understand and live out this type of self-sacrificial love. <clears throat> I always say the best marriages, I think, are where both spouses understand this. Because when they both understand it, they are, they're not thinking about themselves. They're always thinking of the other. That's a hard thing to do. It took me a good year of marriage, first year of marriage. <laughs> 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 I was single until I was almost 41. I was pretty much, you know, uh, so I, you know, it took me a while to understand. He, he wasn't created just to make my life easier. Okay. <laughs> Not a feeling the culture tries to convey. 
Jesus, but we hear agape or caritas, right? Christian love, that's always an act of will. We don't hear in scripture, um, you know, <clears throat> love those people who don't tick you off and pray for the people you love. Okay, but that's not there. Okay, you're not going to find that scripture. You're going to see love your enemies and pray for your persecutors. Well, how can you do that if love's a feeling? Because I don't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going to confession once, and I'll tell you this. I thought I was wronged by someone, and I was having a hard time with him. And I knew. I, I could tell you what the priest would tell me. I knew it. I teach this stuff. I know what he's going to say. <sighs> so I walk in and tell him. And of course, what, what do you think he says? Oh, Pat, you got to pray for that person. Oh, come on. I don't want to pray for that person. You know, they took me out. I don't like them. They really hurt me. You know. I know I have to pray for them. <laughs> Unless 
we choose the Lord. Because we can go through it, um, and, and you know, we can we can do okay, but the depth and the true fulfillment and flourishing that we talk about only come from being one with the Lord, knowing what the Lord asks of us. And I think it's interesting when we see disciple and discipline, right? Same kind of words, right? How can you be a disciple without discipline? Um, a disciple is a follower, right? One who's being taught. And I'm being taught every day by the Lord. I'm bringing up the Word. The discipline is the teaching. So when we talk about the discipline, right? Discipline can be considered systematic instruction given to a disciple. Mary and Martha, Mary sitting at the feet of the Lord. She was a disciple. The Lord was teaching her. In that teaching, you get to know who He is. That teaching enabled them to say, Lord, I know my brother would have lived had you been here. And allowed them to say, you are the resurrection of life. To recognize that. Because they knew who the Lord was. They were in relationship with him. I always say, like with my students, I may be teaching, but it's much more than that. I'm in a relationship with them. I'm not just teaching things just so they can memorize stuff. I believe I'm teaching things that if they open their hearts and minds to it, it will change their lives. And so, if we claim to be this disciple, following the instructions of Christ is just to give it. And again, not out of obligation, but out of happiness and, and love, knowing this is the good life. Because the discipline is that external practice, but it's supposed to bring about an internal change. So it's not that we're just doing something over and over, but if we're really in tune with the Lord by doing it over and over and opening our hearts up, that internal change begins. Like Matthew says, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them must be clean also. So we transform our hearts. We trust the Lord. We surrender to the Lord. And then living the moral code takes care of itself. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. It is fulfilled. The Mosaic Covenant is fulfilled in the new commandment of love. So to be a follower of Christ means that we believe that God loves us and wants what's best for us. Even though we may have struggled growing up, we think that our parents were just there to make our lives miserable. <laughs> Most of us at some point figured out, oh no, that wasn't their purpose. <laughs> their purpose was to guide us because they wanted what was good for us. They loved us. That's the same thing we're called to do with the Lord. Do we trust? Do we trust that he really loves us that much? Because if we trust, it's easy then to respond. To respond to that love, knowing who he has called us to be. He loves us so much that he entered into this experience, became human himself, to save us from sin and death. So that we could be one with him in all eternity, to be about the eternal we're just passing through. That's what I always say about people here. I'm just passing through. Hoping one day to be one with God. Because keeping his commandments is a sign of great love. He even said that. If you love me, we'll do this. Seems like a pretty good response to me. So the way we choose to live is our response. When we live out the discipline of the law of God, we show him how much we love it. And we're living it out. Because we know he loves us. And it leads to the good life. Okay. So that whole idea of continuing then to form yourself in that image of God. So that you can trust him. The more you form yourself into his image. And the more you trust the Lord. The more the moral life just becomes a natural response to life itself. And the nice part is... We don't have to do it alone because God gives us the grace to do it. I always tell my kids, if it's up to me, I'll mess it up. You know, I'll always mess it up. If I think I'm in control or anything, I have this under control, Lord. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I have to give it to God. And that's the grace, right? That's that favor that we're, we're, it's a 
adopted children. He cares about us. He loves us. We can't perfect ourselves. He helps perfect us. And so that is the joy. When we look at all this and we say, how do we do it? How do I trust the Lord? How do I do these things? Well, we open ourselves up to the grace of God. And we trust that He will always help us do that because He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so that's kind of the end for me. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Chief, you can answer everything. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question. You talked initially about moral relativism, right, and your experience with your students. Do you have any tips for having those conversations with others? I mean, we're, we're, it's a difficult time to dialogue with others, especially maybe not from a faith background or a, a background that's kind of antithetical to ours. So what, what are tips for, because like you said, they do get that. Well, you're just shoving your morality. No, I really want to have an honest conversation with you, but it, it's looking that way. So how, how does it... How do you have, you have tips for having those conversations with people? Um, well, I think, you know, with moral relativism, I always just kind of start with, what does the world look like where everybody gets to have their own truth? How do, how do we form community? How do we form relationship when everybody kind of gets to have their own truth? What does that look like to you? Okay. And I usually just start with questions and allow them to start thinking, you know, thinking things through. Um, and, 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 you know, like the student I told you about that wrote in his paper, um, you know, yeah, you know, somebody says, okay, but why, you know, if it's, um, if it's for the good, if I can, you know. And so we talk about that, that, you know, um, well, are there things in and of themselves that are good for all people at all times? What would that look like? Um, and why would they be good? Why would this be good for all people at all times? Um, and, and so it kind of opens discussions. The thing that I notice is getting kids, getting them to think is so important. Because um, we live in a world of sound bites, and I just can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, read some papers today and just went, oh, you know. Um, it, because there's no depth. They're not... You know, they're just skating along the surface, throwing out platitudes they've heard along the way. And there's no real depth of looking at things. And, and so the idea of, of the questions um, are the things that lead them deeper and deeper into the conversation. I think the biggest thing most of us make is we want to tell somebody what we think. Um, and we want to tell them why moral relativism is wrong, right? Um, and and that, look, that's not going to get you anywhere. Um, the only way you invite, and especially I, I do with young people, but the only way you invite them in the, in, is to give them questions to chew on, right? That, that they have to think about it a little bit and, and move them a little bit deeper and, and tie it even to their own experience then when they start. But I find myself asking more questions than I do telling them what I think. Um, because They'll get it. Most of them will get there, you know, um, because they'll start to understand. Oh yeah, you know, um, this is just. I'm, I'm just saying this because this is what I want to do. It has nothing to do with kind of an objective right or wrong. Um, the other piece that I'm, I'm also starting to throw out a little bit more. Um, once we kind of go through the questioning thing, is that everybody has an idea of right and wrong. You know, um, everybody. Uh, and so, but we want our right and wrong to be about the truth. We want to be correct in our, in, in our understanding of what's right and wrong. So we always want to base on the truth. Um, and my students always struggle with that. Well, how do I know it's true, right? Uh, and, you know, you talk about reality, right? Reality is true. Um, and then you talk about, certainly, if, when you talk about Christianity, you know, scripture, what we see here is true. But even uh, philosophically in the world, you know, the rea reality is true. That's getting a little scary now too, since we're since we're disengaging from reality. We're kind of making the world what we want it to be, um, not what it really is. Um, so yeah, so I, for me, those are always kind of the best ways to engage that. But but I'm, I'm kind of also making.
my students realize that I'm not even, I, I interviewed Robert George a couple years ago uh, for the radio, and he made a statement at the time that kind of took me by surprise, but I see it more and more. He said, because I was talking about moral relativism, and he said, Pat, <clears throat> I don't believe there is anything, uh, I don't believe there is moral relativism anymore. He said there is moral absolutism. Everybody thinks their truth is the truth, mm -hmm. and they want everybody to believe that. Mm -hmm. He said true moral relativism is allowing people to have their own truths. He said that's not what we're at anymore. Mm -hmm. He said what we're seeing is everybody has their truth, but they want everybody to say their truth is the truth. And I thought, ooh, you know, I never, I never kind of framed it in that way. Um, so that's not coming to my discussions too with students. You know, that, well, okay, you know, if everybody has their own truth, what does that look like? But does everybody really have their own truth, or are they trying to make you believe their truth? Right? Because people, they get that all the time. You're trying to make us believe, and I'm like, well, yeah. And you have your truth that you want us to believe. You're not outside that moral realm. So we have to be about truth, and you gotta, you gotta get to what truth is, and I think that's the difficulty in this game. Thank you. Does that help? Absolutely. Anything else? Any questions? Comments? Father, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else? They don't have questions. <laughs> <laughs> It's either because they just want to go home or I'm just such a good teacher. <laughs> I answered all the questions before they could ask. <laughs> you just really gave us a lot to chew on. Oh, 
Anything else? Okay, well, thank you, Pat. That's okay. Yeah.